Welcome to IT Trendsetters by Cinercom. Today's discussion is with Bill from Cinercom and David from Entrust. Um, and the topic we're going to be talking about today is code signing and secure development. So David, appreciate your time today. Before we get started, let's start with Bill. Uh, Bill, I think we've crossed paths a few times, but we've never actually got together. This is the first time doing this type of format. So can you tell me a little bit about your role at Cinercom and, and a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, Chris, uh, my role at Cinercom is a software architect. Uh, day to day, I am building software. I am learning and following best practices, but I also consult with organizations, uh, ones who've been, who are new to building software or have been building it for a while. Uh, they wanna know, how do we do this well? How do we do this securely? And uh, I've been doing that for about five years with Cinercom, but professionally being closer to 10 years now. So tell me uh, one thing that you found that you like to do during COVID. Oh man, hiking. Hiking. Uh, it's, it's something I didn't do enough of before, but boy, once things start locking down and start to enjoy nature, hiking's been great. Nice. Well, David, this is the first time we've ever met. Uh, could you talk, uh, tell the audience here a little bit about yourself and, and some background on Entrust? Uh, sure. I, uh, I'm the VP of Professional Services over at Entrust and um, had worked in the security industry for quite a while, um, including some stints at uh, uh, RSA Security. You may have heard of them uh, for 10 years. And then, you know, I've been over here at uh, Encipher slash Entrust now for uh, three years and, um, you know, got to work with a variety of different security topics and got to live through the uh, RSA breach uh, that happened years ago. And, um, you know, in my role right now, I spent a lot, a lot of time talking to customers and, you know, talking specifically about how they can better secure their environments, whether they're building IoT devices or if they're multinational banks. Um, it's a pretty wide playing field, uh, which makes it a lot of fun. And where are we talking to you from? Where are you located? Uh, I am in beautiful Galveston, Texas. Nice. Is it, uh, what's the temperature there today? Uh, well, this morning it was 62. Uh, at lunchtime it was 42. So uh, we're going to get that uh, Arctic blast that everybody's so excited about. Oh yeah, like, you, don't, you don't know what an Arctic blast is where Bill where where Bill is from, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 talking to you guys here from San Diego. I still have shorts on, but I had to put socks on today to keep my keep my feet warm. Ooh. All right, nice. so let's get started. So let's start at a high level here, and um, this is going to get really nerdy between you two, and I'm going to try to uh, ground it as best as possible for us, uh, kind of not so technical people, but tell me what is, what is code signing and what is it used for? Uh, sure, so code signing itself is really the process of taking a piece of code, whether that's, let's say either like a Windows executable or it could be firmware that's running an IoT device or you know, any piece of, of code and applying a cryptographic signature to it. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking a uh, asymmetric key and you are um, taking a hash or a, a, a fingerprint of the code and you're signing that fingerprint and saying, uh, by doing that, you're attesting that yes, uh, I am the holder of this key and I say that this code is from me, is essentially what you're doing. Um, now it's tied to a public key infrastructure behind it so that you know when you get that software, if somebody signed it and it says, you know, hey, this is Entrust signing this, you know who Entrust is and you know to trust them, right? So. I won't go into the whole, you know, what is a PKI because we only have, you know, a couple of hours. But um, yeah, the idea behind it really is um, having trust behind the code that you are are developing. And you know, we're seeing uh, code sign being used a lot more than uh, we'd seen in the past uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is a lot of enterprises now are not allowing their uh, company-owned laptops or servers to run code that isn't signed. Uh, for obvious reasons, hackers, you know, may not want to give you a signed uh, piece of code because they don't have the right certificate to sign it with. 
So that's a great way to kind of block and filter out malware is requiring code to be signed to run it in your environment. Um, and of course, once companies start doing that, all of the software vendors that are supplying them with software also have to have signed their code. Um, so we had a number of customers we worked with that you know, initially hadn't provided signed updates. You know, Their updates were available on their tech support site, for example, right? So yeah, we're pretty sure that if we go to your tech support site and get it, it's from you. But now their laptop doesn't care. It's not gonna run it. It's not gonna run the update unless you have that uh, signature attached to the code. Um, so that's really kind of uh, what it's used for as well as really making sure that whatever it is you're running is genuine. Now, Dave, uh, I think you explained it pretty well about how this establishes uh, trust between the end user, the end environment, and the source code itself, or the, the deployed code, I should say. Uh, but this whole series of trust, what are some of the ways that it can go wrong? How can code signing go wrong? Um, well, there, there's, there's a few ways, right? So uh, while the process seems like, hey, that'd be a great idea. I just sign this, people know it's for me. What could go wrong? Uh, what can go wrong is if somebody impersonates you. So let's say someone's able to gain access to the signing key, right? And now I can take that signing key and I can create a piece of malware. I can use your signing key to sign that malware and I can distribute it. And people will look at it and go, okay, it looks like an update from, you know, Entrust. Uh, it's, it's digitally signed. It's digitally signed by them. Uh, so I trust it. Uh, unfortunately, that, you know, again, if that key is compromised, then um, the code that's being signed isn't really the code that uh, you, you want signed and you, you want with your name on it. And, um, you know, to, to kind of combat that, uh, you know, there's a lot of processes that can kind of go around protecting that key or protecting the process uh, of how that key is used. So that's usually when we're talking to customers, they, they're, they're, that's their biggest concern is making sure that someone isn't signing something that shouldn't be signed um, because that's their name, it's their brand, it's their, their trust. So, so uh, I just, uh, uh, just briefly there, I just, I saw a new word in this, in this that I've never heard, cryptographic hash. Yes. That's, that is so, definitely a new one. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, think of it like a fingerprint, right? So it's unique to every piece of code. It's, it, there's, you know, there's cryptography behind it to calculate that, you know, what that, that string of digits is but essentially it acts as a fingerprint, right? So I don't have to sign, you know, a, a piece of code that might be, you know, uh, hundreds of meg uh, large. I just have to get a fingerprint of what that code is and I can sign that fingerprint, which is much, much smaller. Um, you know, maybe a, a question, question for you, Bill, um, you know, in your experience, um, you know, can you think of any examples where code signing has, has gone wrong? Yeah, you know what? First place I think of is the news for that, Dave. Now, it probably doesn't make mainstream news all the time, but there are quite a few examples that uh, people have seen headlines for. So I was thinking, I tell you what, I'll give you an example of a couple prominent ones, and let's see if we can't identify them together just based on the details. Yep. Uh, now, these sorts of things, every time I see them, they're always somebody getting into the build process in order to compromise the code signing itself. So uh, there are really two ways to do that. You're either on the outside breaking in, uh, for instance, some type of remote attacker, or even from the inside out in some cases. So uh, how about this? Uh, SQL injection. So you have some kind of public facing application host on the internet. Uh, SQL injection leads to a compromised network, lateral movement, takes the attacker to the build process and there the, the build process is compromised and some malicious code makes it out signed. Uh, any idea who that might be? Well, uh, there's probably a couple that come to mind. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's a, a, a pretty popular one that's out there now that um, I'm not sure it was compromised through SQL injection, but 
um, very similar moving laterally into the build process to, to get malware signed and, and distributed. And obviously that's solar winds. But um, I don't know if that's the one you were talking about. Absolutely. Uh, that one wasn't SQL injection, but it follows yeah. basically the same format. Yep. Uh, you know, I've read some of the details about that one and it's, it's crazy the patience involved. Once you get that outside access, yep. once you've compromised a single system, moving around, patiently waiting months, testing yep. things with empty classes and the code, seeing if you can get away with signing it, yep. sophisticated stuff. Oh yeah, I mean, it was clearly the work of a very patient, well-funded and uh, um, very well-schooled uh, uh, attacker who not only understood you know, the, the methods of attack, but also, also the methods of defense. And I think that was one thing about the hack where they really understood how people would be looking for the intrusion so that they did a really good job of covering it up, hiding it, obfuscating it. And obviously that makes it a huge challenge for companies to try and defend against something like that, because, you know, how do you, how do you defend against the unknown or how do you, you know, uh, fight something that's already designed with your defenses in mind, right? This isn't the days of, you know, AV, signature-based AV, where, you know, we, we've seen this hack before and we just spot it. Yeah. Uh, hey, Dave, have you ever used Team Viewer? Um, uh, yes, actually I have. That's a, I read about an interesting one. They, uh, so there's nothing wrong with TeamViewer itself in this instance, yep. uh, but there is a software developer that was running it and using it as a service for a remote desktop. Yep. Through some stolen credentials, somebody compromised through TeamViewer that developer's machine. You get your privileged machine there, you do some lateral movement, uh, maybe yep. install some key logging malware and Boom, that made a headline for CCleaner. Yep. Which, uh, that was a popular one for cleaning up Windows desktop environments. Yep, and I think you know uh, one of the challenges that a lot of times we have in talking with folks who are in the, sort of the development community or you know, are responsible for the DevOps in their, in their uh, company is you know, developers almost inherently believe that they know what they're doing and nobody's gonna get at them, right? Because they're smart technical people, right? And they're not going to do anything dumb like have guessable passwords or, um, you know, anything like that. Right? Never, right? So, um, you know, a lot of times there's sort of resistance to locking down those environments because, you know, developers like to be able to do whatever they need to do technically uh, and not have to worry about it. Um, but, you know, when you get breaches like this, it sort of underscores the, uh, the importance of uh, keeping that development environment uh, secure. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of these smart engineers and such, it, it seems like no matter what, it's only a matter of time before the human element comes into play. Yep. Uh, even the best systems can't do much when a uh, phishing campaign is successful and installs malware on some engineer system. Yep. And yeah. And I think, you know, as we kind of link that back to the, the code signing world, we see a lot of folks who are, who are doing code signing, but you know, the keys are in a develop on a developer laptop. Like, oh, the, he's, the, he's the build lead. He's got the keys on his laptop and he signs it. Well, same thing. If I, if he, you know, gets fished or somebody in his, uh, in his facility gets fished and they're able to move laterally in his laptop, then, you know, poof, they can, they can sign it because there's no real control over it. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about with customers a lot is, you know, you can have a dev environment where that's loosey goosey. That's fine. You know, have a development key to sign the stuff with and trust that key only in the development environment. So uh, that way you're not worried about, you know, great development key gets compromised. I don't really care because nobody's going to trust it outside of my little dev environment. And I'm also not, you know, I'm only using it to trust to execute code that I just built myself uh, as opposed to something that's publicly trusted that I'm shipping out to you know, 30,000 customers around the world. Makes sense. Well, Dave, there seems to be a common element in all this and that uh, once someone's compromised the system, they, uh, they inevitably get access to the supply chain. Um, now, I mean, it seems like for a lot of systems, compromise will happen in a matter of time. It's, it's not really if, it's when. Uh, people try to stay proactive, but 
what can they do? I mean, what, what can they do to improve the security of that process? How do they protect their code signing? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a couple of threads there, right? So um, yeah, if you look at some of those breaches that are very detailed and involved, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways that the attackers look to, to sort of get in, get in the door. And to your point, you have to assume they're going to get in, right? There's uh, way, way too many examples of places where people thought they were secure. I've got great perimeter security. I've got, you know, I analyze all my logs looking for stuff that's happening. And, you know, that, that's, all, that's all well and good. And you need that too. Um, but, you know, if you're looking to, to secure sort of the code signing process, I guess, you know, the, the real key pieces there are um, obviously securing that, uh, securing that key is, is paramount. And uh, a lot of the companies that we're talking to now are look, looking to start to do that centrally, right? They're looking at as a security resource, as a security thing and not a development thing, right? So they want the security team to hold that, protect that, but enable the development team to use it as necessary. So, and that's really sort of the second piece, which is uh, how do I have appropriate, uh, you know, workflow, appropriate access control, appropriate identity so that, you know, if I do want to sign something uh, at that moment, I know that it, it makes sense to be signing something at that moment. Like, yes, we did plan to get a customer build out or a hot fix out. So I would expect now to, to sign sign that hot fix, um, know who's requesting it, know that, um, you know, somebody may have to approve that and say, yep, you know, as the security manager, I'm gonna, you know, verify that this is the right thing and say yes before we go ahead and sign it. So that sometimes the automated processes that attackers might take advantage of uh, might work in a, uh, a dev environment. The minute you start to go into something that's externally trusted, you can kind of step back and say, like, we want it, We want some human eyes on this thing that's going out the door, because hopefully we're not building stuff that's going out the door every couple of hours, right? We might be doing that internally, but not externally. That's um, funny. While the human element can weaken some processes, it seems like it strengthens others. Yeah. Well, again, it's just finding some, uh, you know, finding someone to take a, an objective look at at, at what's occurring, um, because again, attackers are pretty good at fooling systems that are known and well-defined. Uh, sometimes it's a little tougher uh, to get some of the stuff past uh, a human. Oddly enough, it seems like the reverse of, of what, what we've been teaching for years that computers are smarter, but uh, sometimes it is that just that human look that says, hey, wait, that doesn't seem right. So I think, you know, uh, I guess, you know, it might be good to kind of take a little bit of a step back and we were talking about the build process. Um, if you can, you know, Bill, kind of maybe talk a little bit about sort of the, sort of where's that, what's the bigger picture of the build process and how, how you see code signing uh, fitting into that? Sure. So I can offer the developer perspective here. And the bigger picture for me is software development lifecycle. Um, that is, uh, that is, from the beginning to the end, and it's cyclical, of course, uh, in that you can start out with code and eventually it is deployed and running, but then you make updates and you keep it going. So in that cycle, code signing to me falls in the deployment phase. When you're ready to put it to test or production, uh, you need code signing to ensure integrity and trust. Well, how does that, how does that challenge? So being in the development environment, does that, introduce any challenges to you? Um, I mean, because obviously uh, we can always talk about all these great and wonderful security measures, but if they get in the way of, you know, doing your job or, or what you perceive to be as, you know, uh, or perceived to be difficult, you know, sometimes they're not maybe widely adopted. So have you seen any examples of that or, you know, any, any other areas where you think that this might, uh, the SDLC might be challenged? Yeah, uh, so the SDLC, the more you add to it, and code signing is adding another step or series of steps to your SDLC, it's increased complexity. Uh, sometimes development teams are strained on resources or time or both. And uh, what we see here is, well, the complexity, it causes uh, weaknesses. So uh, like, first of all, the complexity of code signing, it generally increases your attack surface. 
Uh, maybe that's a particular machine, appliance, or installed solution. And maybe you didn't have a, an automated build process before, but introducing code signing, you did. In any case, whether human or automated, it tends to just add more steps to the process. Yep. Some companies treat it as a check mark. Hey, yay, we do this. Maybe they don't do it well. And others take it very seriously. They, they value their users. They value data. They value yep. the integrity of the whole process. But in 2021, things, even if your build process isn't getting more complicated, a lot of times your deployment one is. Um, from cloud versus on-prem to test production uh, to, gosh, uh, I mean, even the type of environment. Maybe you're not deploying to a VM like you used to. And maybe you're deploying to some kind of containerized cluster. Maybe it's an app store running on a thick client or a mobile uh, phone. Just things have changed and become very, very complicated. That's a lot of challenge for development teams to keep up with it. And I think also, um, you know, to your earlier point about increased attack surface, as things get more complicated, there's more moving parts. That's more, you know, potential parts that could be exploited or compromised uh, al along the way. Absolutely. And uh, Dave, I mean, we've, we've talked about some of the things that can go wrong, uh, the complexity that we see today. And in, in 2021, I mean, from your perspective, what what sorts of steps should people be taking? I mean, what should they look to add to their process this year to strengthen it or simplify it to get it under control? Yeah, so I, I think you know certainly within the, within the SDLC, uh, you know that maybe hasn't been traditionally the amount of security attention that there's been to a lot of other areas and companies, right? And so if you think about you know uh, network and perimeter defense and threat analysis and you know crowdsourcing of threat data and you know a lot of companies are doing that kind of stuff but you know within the software development life cycle itself maybe not as much attention has been paid uh, to security so i think you know certainly recent breaches will will kind of encourage folks to think a little bit more about looking at the sdlc as a whole and i think you know within that um you know you look to to protect the the pieces right look to protect the build process look to protect the automation look to protect your source repositories uh, and of course, look to protect the, your code signing, right? Because it doesn't do you any good to, you know, you're protecting all that other stuff and then someone just takes their own malware, signs it with your, with your uh, keys and then uh, poof, they can uh, uh, you know, distribute that malware with your name on it. So um, I think that, you know, a big part of it is trying to view uh, the whole SDLC and how can I secure those individual uh, parts better um, you know, knowing that nothing is, you know, ever 100% completely secure from a really determined, well-resourced attacker, but, you know, certainly you want to take due care of all of the, the steps within your process, try to do the right thing, protect the stuff that you know is the most valuable, and, um, you know, I, ideally make that just sort of part of the normal process of building products within your own company, right, is... Yeah, security is part of it, just like security is part of, you know, uh, everyday life now. And it wasn't 20 years ago, uh, but but now it's just, you know, it, it's kind of baked in and built into to uh, to companies, and they're they're very mindful of it. I think SDLC is one area where we can really uh, kind of extend that. And I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Again, being a developer yourself. Yeah, I think the, the biggest impact on that uh, for me is securing my SDLC was really, it started with picking a framework. Uh, in the development world, there seems to be a framework for everything, whether you're doing a client or a server application, but uh, this is yet another one, but it, it doesn't have as much to do with the code itself. Um, so the one I picked out, and I've looked at quite a few, but my favorite so far is BSIM, mm -hmm. the building security and maturity model. And really it's, it's a collection of best practices. Um, I found that really helpful for my team and also the teams I've worked with at other organizations uh, to suggest that they adopt a framework like BSIM and use it to track what they do now and what they want to do next and what other people are doing. It's, it's really a great way to figure out where you're at. You can't improve on something that you're not aware of. And then roadmap where you want to go next. 
Um, I mean, beyond that, I mean, how, how do you know when it comes to code signing certificates and such, when something's gone wrong with yours, how do you, how do you keep up with certificates? Dave, how do you, how do you know when your certificate's been compromised or misused? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times you find out because somebody somebody calls you <laughs> and no. says, "Hey, uh, I'm you know over at XYZ Company, and we're we're trying to figure out you know we, we've got a malware infestation, and and we're trying to figure out why uh, you know this executable went out with your signature on it. Uh, obviously, that's not a phone call anybody wants, or, or you know uh, this is Fred from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We'd like to ask you some questions." Also, not how you want to find out that, 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 that things have gone wrong. So, you know, the, the PKI infrastructure that backs up code signing itself does have the means to report compromised certificates, right? So, you know, if like, oh, something's happened, uh, you know, I can report that to my certificate issuer and say, hey, this has been compromised. You know, that, that information can go out via what's called a certificate revocation list. Uh, that that basically provides you with data on certificates that may have been compromised, right? So um, as in many security things, you know, when something does go wrong, the, the faster you can respond to it and the, the more you can limit your exposure because of it, the better, right? So, um, you know, ironically, I think that the biggest issue we see with certificates in doing code signing is people just understanding what, what certificates they have and when they expire and you know how long they're good for, who's used them. Uh, you get companies that may have acquired other companies, and it can be a really kind of confusing picture. And um, you know that's we're trying to at least either centralize it from a technology perspective, or at least from a logical perspective, so that you know you have an organization or an entity in the company that's responsible for knowing what certificates are being used for what purpose and if there is something that's going wrong or they suspect something might've happened, can know what to do, know how to take action. Yeah, speaking of, uh, with the organizations you've worked with, does anyone do fire drills, uh, incident response when, before a real incident has happened? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I can tell you from uh, past employers that uh, uh, we definitely have practiced that a lot more after the breach uh, because you kind of got the exposure of, you know, what it was like to go through one. Now, we were pretty lucky because, you know, we had plans in place already. We had, you know, uh, an incident response center internally that we could report the problem to. You know, they were able to have forensic data almost immediately to tell them what was going on. We could understand effectively what had been compromised. And, you know, uh, because... You know, this was at RSA, and this is public knowledge, so we don't have to edit this out. But um, you know, they uh, because they had the capability to, to be able to look at all this stuff, it enabled them to understand exactly what was compromised. Uh, probably one of the biggest challenges for an enterprise could be, hey, we've had attackers, we discovered some attackers in our network. They've been here for six months. We have no idea what they've gotten, right? Because then at that point, you're like, you could assume everything's been compromised, and you have no way to to know or either to refute that or, or to confirm it. And that obviously makes your incident response job a whole lot bigger because the fire is everywhere, right? It's not, here's my fire, let me go fight it. It's, you know, it, it's everything. So, um, but we do see a lot of companies now trying to go through much like they've done in the past with things like disaster recovery drills, right? A lot of big organizations do those every you know six months or every year hey we're going to fail over this data center tonight right because we have to practice and make sure that everything's working uh same now is true with a lot of security incident response of okay what happens if we suddenly find out you know this system's been compromised go you know <laughs> well what do you what do you do um, and that that does save a lot of um panic and running around in circles when something happens because not only do you have a document somewhere that tells you what to do, but you, you've actually done it. Yeah, uh, I found it really empowering on all of this to do a little bit of threat modeling. Um, I, that might be new to some folks, but essentially if you can figure out what does an, an outside attack look like to us? And then uh, for extra credit, what does an inside attack look like? Yep. One of the prominent examples was 
a subcontractor was fished. And so they didn't even need to compromise the system from the outside. They just compromised his workstation and, and then moved laterally from there once he was inside. But uh, threat modeling, that's, that's been big. Uh, but in all this, is, has there been a laxness with uh, secrets management, with the protection and, uh, well, I guess the securing of these secrets themselves? So yeah, from a secrets management perspective, and you know that's that's one of the things that's kind of been in, in in vogue the last couple of years is you know don't have an administrator password, right? Have it be some random piece of you know of garbage that's untypable, and you know uh, find a secure place to store that, and then when the time comes when you really need it, we're going to allow you access to that secret to have access to that system. So uh, we do see people kind of going down that. Uh, that path uh, for managing those secrets. Um, a lot of it is um, just really kind of segmenting the, that type of knowledge so that it is compartmentalized. So if you do get a compromised contractor, right, it, it's going to affect a relatively small footprint, right? So it's back to your threat modeling comment. Um, you know, if you understand what that looks like, okay, well, you know, what would this person have access to? What do they sometimes need access to, but most of the time they don't. Uh, and then how do we control that? How do we control the secrets required for that uh, access or, you know, other secrets? You know, what's the, you know, what's the uh, password for these service accounts or what's, uh, you know, uh, in the IoT world? Yeah, there's a, you know, a password that's unique to every you know, module we send out on our lawn mowing robots. So I don't pick a, a random IoT device, right? Um, yeah, so that if I need to actually go and service it, I have the ability to, you know, a unique secret for that device, uh, as opposed to one blanket admin password that, you know, or one blanket secret that gets posted on the internet within 30 seconds of your first lawn mower going out the door. And, you know, before you know it, people are hacking your lawn mowers uh, left and right because, you know, they haven't protected that. So. Kind of a far field example, but um, you know stuff that we definitely see uh, customers talking about. Absolutely. Well, Dave, I know you and I covered a lot of detail here. Um, do you have maybe three high level takeaways in all of this? Um, um, what should people do? What are three things companies should be doing in twenty twenty one? So I think you know uh, num number one is ingrained security in your thinking about your business. Right. So easy enough to say, and, and people have their own security functions that they're supposed to worry about that. But sometimes you need to think about it in sort of the, 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 the bigger picture. And, um, you know, I think, you know, your point about threat modeling is on point for that as well, which is, you know, you need to think about what what could happen. And I guess the second thing really is, um, you know, don't assume it can't happen to you. Uh, I think if anything uh, has been clear over the years in security, it's that um, organizations that find themselves in a lot of trouble always thought they were okay, right? Um, and uh, I think, you know, it, it is important for them to understand that, um, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving landscape. This is not, security is not a one shot, like I did this, now I'm good uh, type of a thing. You know, and I think the third thing, which is probably a little more specific to some of the stuff we talked about here is, um, you know, take a good look at your code signing process and, uh, you know, determine if it's appropriate given the, uh, you know, maybe size and scope of the development environment within your, uh, within your company, uh, you know, what, what an impact would look like to you if that was compromised and, um, you know, your capability to kind of balance ease of use or making it easy for developers versus completely locked down by a security function where developers are having trouble doing their jobs. So those would be, those would be my three. What, what are your three, Bill? Uh, well, first of all, you got to pick a framework. Uh, that's been really helpful for me. I recommend it for everyone. Uh, learn your best practices, figure out what you're doing now, where you want to go next. Um, secure SDL framework like BSIM will go a long way. Uh, after that, you got to know your attack surface. There are a lot of attack surface. Uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of attack surface growth in recent years with the complexity of build pipelines and things. So I recommend everybody be monitoring your attack surface. Uh, there are 
great services um, like one we've been building lately for continuous pen test that mm -hmm. help organizations discover all of their external assets, uh, discover what they are, where they are, and what's open on them. Very powerful. I mean, almost every example of a breach has been, hey, someone got in and then compromised the supply chain. Yep. It all starts at the attack surface. And mm -hmm. uh, the last one is to get serious about secrets management. If someone's compromised your systems, uh, then make sure you have good segmentation and protection of those secrets. Uh, no more plain text on the file system. No, thank you. Uh, there are a lot of things we could be doing to improve there. Uh, those are my three. Okay, fair enough. And I think they're all, you know, they're, they're all, all all good points. And, uh, you know, I know the folks listening to the, uh, you know, uh, podcast or the, the video will, you know, probably have seen some of that in their, in their environment already, but it is important to kind of, you know, keep the, keep the vigilance up, right? There is no, there's no uh, end of the game, right? It's, right. I guess maybe when we get to or be lucky enough to retire, um, then we only have to worry about being victimized users instead of security professionals. Right. So Bill, um, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, the, the attack surface and, you know, the attack surface really is sort of that that laundry list or that uh, inventory of all the potential ways that an environment can be uh, compromised or entered or uh, misused. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit about the importance of really understanding that. Um, can you give me an example or a, you know, a, a situation where uh, that had proven to be important to a, a customer or a partner? Absolutely. Um, as as a lot, these companies have moved some of their assets into the cloud, uh, we found that a lot of times it becomes hard to manage what they have. Uh, there's an age old saying, you can't manage what you don't know. And in a lot of cases, uh, the attack surface on a cloud infrastructure can be daunting. So from that standpoint, uh, securing things, you can't even do it if you don't know what you have. So in that way, I've been recommending attack surface monitoring. Uh, if you're looking for something to do in 2021, get a handle on your external attack surface. Know what you have, know what's out there, and what's open on it. Uh, Cinecom has developed continuous pen test to discover and, and keep track of everything and show you action items. And that's been a really powerful tool for our, our customers lately. Oh, gentlemen, uh, David, Bill, I appreciate your thought leadership today expertise and insights, uh, very valuable. Uh, to our listeners out there, you are listening to IT Trendsetters by Centercom. Thank you.